Namaste. So today we're going to talk more about name and form. Name and form together with consciousness are extremely important in the process of dependent arising. Name and form and consciousness have a reciprocal relationship where name and form is dependent on consciousness, but then consciousness also depends on name and form. And why is that? Well, there's this quote from the Buddha. In so far only, Ananda, can one be born or grow old or die or pass away or reappear. In so far only is there any pathway for verbal expression. In so far only is there any pathway for terminology. In so far only is there any pathway for designation. In so far only is the range of wisdom. In so far only is the round of samsara kept going for there to be a designation as the thisness, that is to say, name and form together with consciousness. Now, what is a thisness? What does the Buddha mean by thisness? Well, as we said before, the actual reality is a seamless oneness. There really is no sharp boundary between one thing and another. It's like the ocean. You go out in the middle of the ocean and it's like trackless. You can't trace where you've been. Uh, there's no landmarks, there's no markings, just endless waves. Huh? So what happens is that we form a whirlpool, we form a vortex, and the vortex consists of consciousness and name and form. Consciousness is the effort to go against the flow of nature. As we noted so many times, the nature of the world is impermanence, suffering, and not self. So consciousness is the effort, the deliberate effort, fueled by sankhara, to make something permanent, pleasurable, and self. So how does it do that? Well, it needs support, and it gets that support from name and form. Terminology. Uh, so name and form supports consciousness. Consciousness supports name and form. And they go round and round and round. And this is the whirlpool. This is the vortex. And this makes... Is this like X marks the spot, huh? The whirlpool marks the spot where I am. This is me. This is mine. Huh? This is my show, man. This is the whirlpool, <laughs> the vortex. In the middle of the ocean, with no landmarks, no boundaries, the whirlpool serves as a marker. That this is where I am. This is me. This is my life. This is myself. And so we depend on this reciprocal relationship of dependency between name and form and consciousness. And the Buddha explicitly calls this out. But let's, first, let's look a little bit more into uh, the nature of name and form. We read this the last time. And what bhikkhus is name and form? Feeling, perception, intention, contact, attention. This is called name. The four great elements and the form derived from the four great elements. This is called form. Thus this name and this form are together called name and form. So I made a little diagram that might help you understand this. Name is the combination of intention, attention, feeling, perception, and contact. So we have an intention, and the intention, at least in the beginning, is simply to exist, to be, to become something, to become somebody. 
And so that draws our attention toward a particular name and form. Then we get feelings about that. Perception, contact, and feeling kind of go together. We have a perception of a name and form when we get a contact with it through one or more of our senses. And then when we have that perception, we get a feeling about it. So these are the four elements, the gestalt of name. Huh? After we have this experience, we slap a name on it. And this is what's going on in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta also. We have an experience of intention, attention, feeling, perception, and contact. And then we name it. That's called reflexive consciousness because it's a reflex, it's a habit. We look back in our memories and we see, well, what experiences did I have before that were similar to this? And then we take the name that we gave to those experiences and apply it to this one too. And it very much is dependent on the function of the thing that we're contacting. Like we say, this is my body. Huh? But if you look at bodies in general, there's so much variation between them. The one thing that they have in common, I mean, look at some of these weird deep sea uh, fish and stuff like that. Huh? What do they all have in common? All bodies form a vortex to locate a living being. Somebody who's stuck in samsara. And this forms the locus, this forms the location. This vortex gives the being a place an identity, a name. So we put names, we put symbols on these gestalts of intention, attention, feeling, perception, and contact. And then we give them a name. In the case of the body, we give it my name. <laughs> Actually, we have no name. Our name, again, is given in terms of function. So, what about form? Well, form is composed of earth, which is the solid matter, water, liquid matter, air, gas matter, and fire, or plasma. So, these are the four states of matter according to physics. The Buddha had figured this all out thousands of years ago. And even before him, these four elements were well known in Sankhya philosophy and so on. But the, how do we recognize these four elements when we encounter them? It's by resistance, isn't it? Something that's made of earth has a solid feel to it. It gives a lot of resistance. We can't penetrate it. Water is less dense. We can penetrate it, but it still gives resistance. And air gives almost no resistance at all. You have to move very fast to feel any resistance from the air. As anyone who's stuck their arm out of a, a fast-moving car's window <laughs> can tell you. You can feel the resistance. Hmm? And finally, there's plasma. Our main contact with plasma is in fire, when we light a fire or we light the stove. But fire is subtly present in the body's metabolism because the body is a heat engine. So there's actually the presence of plasma, but it's subtle. Plasma is simply ionized molecules, usually ionized gas. So you can verify this by putting a magnetic field around a flame. And then watch what happens. The flame will move. The flame will change shape according to the magnetic field lines. But anyway, let's not get into all that physics. 
<laughs> These four elements go together to form form. And according to the different mixture of substances and textures and the resistance and so on, then we get this form or that form. And of course, we also slap a name on that. <laughs> Even though actually every form is different. Every body is different. Every teacup, we used the example last time, every teacup is different. It can be made of so many different materials and so on. Every animal is different, yet we call them all by one name, animal. You see how we generalize, how we abstract things, how we make categories and, and uh, uh, dump people in buckets, <laughs> people, things, objects, all kinds of forms go in these buckets of categories that we make up. That is why the uh, scope and completeness of one's ontology is so important. We have to have an ontology that allows for the higher states of being, that gives names to them, you see, this is why the Buddha created the Eightfold Noble Path. And he admits it's a created thing. It's, it's a sankara. It's fabricated. He admits it. And he also says it's like a raft. And when you reach the other shore, you don't cling to the raft. You give it up. So when one reaches the state that the Buddha is talking about, Nibbana, huh? which is the stilling of all sankhara, the relinquishment of all assets or possessions, the destruction of all craving or desire. Uh, this is peaceful. This is excellent, <laughs> he says. This is Nibbana, cessation, no more birth and death. So how do we do that? Well. We get a clue from Jnananda. He says, name and form means a formal name and a nominal form. Form is known with the help of name. Just as feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention represent the primary notion of name, even so, the four great elements form the basis for the primary notion of form. So if we know this and we can observe it, huh? and instead of making an aggregate and saying, this is the name of this th form, huh? instead we, we drop those symbols, we drop those abstractions and those categories, and we simply look into the basic perceptions, the gestalt that makes them up. Hmm? the five factors of name and the four factors of form. And there are uh, meditation methods where we look into our experience and identify all these things and bring them into awareness. Forget about the names, uh, forget about the symbols and the abstractions, but just concentrate on the raw sense inputs this is a special type of attention given in the Mahanadana Sutta or the Satipatthana Sutta. All these are worth studying. So what is the benefit of this? Well, here's a quote. There is a tangle within and a tangle without. The world is entangled with a tangle. About that, O Gotama, I ask you, who can disentangle this tangle? And the answer is, where name and form, as well as resistance and the perception of form, are completely cut off. It is there that the tangle gets snapped. So the Buddha is saying that one should break this uh, reciprocal relationship between name and form and consciousness. 
take name and form completely out of consciousness. And in that stilling of the whirlpool, the tangle that entangles us in samsara is broken. Another quote. From where do currents turn back? Where whirls no more the whirlpool? Where is it that name and form is held in check in every way complete? Where earth and water, fire and wind find no footing, from there it is that currents turn back. There the whirlpool whirls no more, and there it is that name and form is held in check in a way complete. See, these are riddles that were posed to the Buddha. And he answered them like this. So where is it that all these uh, name and form and consciousness turn back? It's in the consciousness or in the awareness of the Arhant. Someone who has stilled the Sankara, someone who has stopped the vortex from rotating, someone who has stopped the habitual creation of the ego through the rotation between name and form and consciousness. One more quote. He has cut off the whirlpool and reached desirelessness. The stream dried up, now no longer flows. The whirlpool cut off, whirls no more. This, even this, is suffering's end. And of course, the end of suffering is nothing but Nibbana. So you see, this is the actual aim of the Buddha's path. It's subtle. It's not easy to understand. I know. I've spent the last, what is it now, eight years studying this. And even going back into the Vedic path to get some perspective on it. And why weren't these things understood by the Vedic scholars? Well, they were. They were realized by the sages. But because of the, the Vedic language, the positivism of the Vedic language, it was impossible to express accurately. The Buddha's breakthrough was in the creation of an ontology, a language, a terminology, that allows the expression in a negative way and so facilitates our getting rid of this tangle and cutting off this whirlpool and stopping this name and form business, uh, the business of symbolic thinking, rationality, and so forth. Uh, and we, we think rationality is such a great thing, but then why is it destroying the planet? So these are all things to contemplate. And we'll go on with the discussion in the next episode and present much, much more evidence regarding the nature of name and form and its cessation. Buddha Saranai. <laughs>